morning again. And so uh, this time I'm speaking like a Cornell employee. Are you? Cornell employee. Fine. Um, and so I want to acknowledge Peter Wright. Peter Wright is here. So uh, Peter and I uh, and a few others work in the Dairy Environment Systems Program. And uh, so we work on system solutions for the dairy and the environmental side tied into to economics and social. Um, I want to acknowledge, uh, so none of these folks right here directly, eh, I might be a little short on saying that. So nice CERTA, the second bullet, they put a lot of money towards projects that we can fund a project for that will be able to help create information that help us kind of keep trying to grow ourselves and help the industry. So NYSERDA has been an excellent sponsor. Um, the U.S. dairy farmers, so I've been blessed to be able to work with a lot of great dairy farmers over 30 years. And so is Peter. He's a little older than I am, by the way, if you haven't noticed. Um, 40 years, maybe. And so really, really thankful for them for helping us uh, in, in, in opening the doors and let us do a lot of work. Our peers, a lot of great people in this room. We've learned a lot from. We really appreciate you guys. So all of you folks are part of this knowledge base that goes and talks like this. And then, of course, there's Agri Markets in New York State who funds the pro-dairy program. You can't forget them because they pay salaries for Peter and myself. So I did touch on sustainability by saying environmental, uh, social, and economic. Um, so Jenny Pronto, who uh, was worth this for eight years full time, she wrote an article about dairy sustainability and put this in the article. Um, and uh, so around the outside is a circle with uh, uh, several items there, right? These are a few items that a dairy farmer has to be aware of and not just be aware of, but diligently pursuing and proving in um, to be sustainable. Or as Norm Scott, some of you will recognize that name, Norm Scott, Scott says, working towards sustainability, recognizing we can always continue to improve um, in that way. So if you think about manure, there's a, there's, there's a lot of these things touch on manure, I'm not gonna spend the time. But speaking of Norm, he took this, this what we call their dairy circle, and I just didn't get the name on the top of the previous slide because it was not allowing me to do it very easily. And he threw in a whole bunch of other items. So you could just use, you know, use your, we, there's certainly other items to be used, uh, added to this dairy sustainability circle, they're important for farms to work towards being more sustainable. So that's what we're about, is, is dairy sustainability. So when we come to <coughs> thinking about consideration of value in our treatment system for dairy farms, it's about helping them work towards sustainability from an environmental, um, not exclusively at all, but primarily, and, and definitely from an economic and social standpoint. So when I started at Cornell, I was basically working 100% to serve the dairy farmer. Now I say a lot of my extension work a lot of even our communications are to the non-dairy industry about topics that we need to stand up for. And so it's things interesting how things have changed. So who pays the bill on the dairy farm? If we're going to be sustainable on the economic front, who's paying the bill on the dairy farm? I don't mind who's writing the check. That could be the spouse or daughter or son. Who's paying the bills? Yeah. The cows. Right. The cows. And one of the most important things, if you don't know this already, that dairy, like everything, a lot of other things in the agriculture, is a commodity. What does that mean? Are you a price askers or price takers, as our CEO of Eastman says? You're a price taker. It means you can implement the best environmental sustainability system out there today. Can you get a cent more for your milk? Nonetheless, it cuts your cost or you sell a product from it. So we got to remember the cows are paying the bills. And so there's a long ways to go. So let's just take a little, a, 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 a snippet of a, of a New York State dairy farm that happens to be right along Interstate 81 between Binghamton and Syracuse, maybe about halfway. Um, and uh, so, uh, so basically there's some lactating cow barns, there's a lake, and there's manure storage. Right, and so most farms of of this size are going to have manure storage. Right, it's a water quality best management practice. It's not an air quality best management practice. So if you think about this, we have water quality best management practice because of the lake and shallow groundwaters in this area. But what do we have? So we have uh, Peter and his wife. They have a, a retreat house here on the lake. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so they're neighbors, and then we have neighbors around the farm. And so we got water quality being peace, but we were producing odors. And so, as I said before, people see with their noses a lot of time. And 
and, and uh, thinking back to when I was uh, growing up, my mom would complain about smells. I used to like to trap. I used to like, and I do like to hunt still. I used to like to do taxidermy. I would tan all my own hides to, to do taxidermy work. And she couldn't stand the smell of that stuff going on, despite the other herbs that are associated where we lived. And to me, it's like, it's not at all. So think about anybody bird hunting. Use dogs to bird hunt. Multiple dogs. So you'll know some dogs have better noses than others, right? So, so just because you don't think it's offensive doesn't mean that somebody else does. Not. They, they certainly can. And a lot of them do. So we've got to be aware of that. Odor is a huge issue. Um, these, these BMP, water quality BMPs produce manure gases. We already talked about that. And so we can cover, right? And cut down on our gas emissions if we have a flare and the flare works right and all that kind of stuff. We've got details of that. Uh, we also can install an amber digester, right? So this farm, contingent for getting a permit to build, and that's a little bit weird because in New York there isn't most, much, much permitting when, went, when it comes to building farms. Um, but the local authority here said, well, you know, we really want you to have a digester. This is a green site dairy several years ago. So they build an amber digester. So results of manure odor control are, okay, now we can think about applying treated manure on cropland at a time when the crop needs the nutrients. There's little to any way this is going to happen in the middle of summer and most of New York is raw manure between cuttings of hay. Um, this is right up the road from where I live. I'm not saying this is the, you know, so what the message is here is they put it on in the summer. You can see how tall the corn is. It's probably between third and fourth cutting. Um, and, you know, applying manure is, is, is an art. And a lot of people, you know, there's a little ways to go. So don't get hung up on there's a little bit over application right there. The message is, is it's applied when the crop needs it. Um, this is a this is technology we saw 15 years ago in the day for applying. Um, so, but just because we have odor control doesn't mean we always will preclude runoff from happening if we have to apply other times of the year. So um, we have our share of challenges in New York because of our topography and our dairy farm density in upstate New York with um, runoff. Now, none of this is from New York. This is other things. <laughs> So our, co our good colleague, Carl Zimmick, who some of you know, um, he shared these slides to me. He said, they're not going to I saw they're not going to try to send them off. Um, so digesting it has a, lot of, has a lot of benefits, and we'll talk about a little bit of that in a minute. We'll get into the system solution, which <coughs> great job on that point. Um, so uh, we, we apply our, oops, getting trigger happy here. We apply our digested manure. It's more plant available. Nutrients are more plant available than non-digested manure. That's a good thing. If you have a nine-month nine nine storage, to protect water quality, so maybe we don't have to fall, uh, spread in the fall. I'm not saying that's happening right now, but if, if we had it, then we may have too many nutrients. So we, we prepare the manure to have be more plant available. We store it for nine months. Um, we put it down in the spring. Maybe we've got too many nutrients in the farm to use. So that really can drive us towards more. So there's, there's all kinds of things going on here, and, 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 and if you don't know this already, which I think most of us do know, is that over time, the cows per farm are going, they're getting higher, but the number of farms are going down. This is only through 2011. This graph just continues now. Um, when I started at Cornell in, over 20 years ago, there was 8,500 dairy farms in New York State. Now there's like 3,900 dairy farms. Talk about impact, program impact. They're always challenged on program impact, right? If you work at a university, you know that. Um, so that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> okay, so farm, farms are you know there's more cows, more density. So um, some of the key considerations now kind of like feeding into the purpose of the talk. So um, selection of treatment processes should be based on farm goals, needs, and abilities. Right. So there's different management levels. There's different management interests. There's different abilities of managers to 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 uh, get employees to do certain things on these farms, and that all has to go into this. So if you're working with a farm, that's an important aspect. So we, we tend to like to generate lots of spreadsheets and lots of stuff. And I was talking to one of our nutrient colleagues yesterday, colleagues yesterday, and was like, look, we can, we, yeah, we can say we're going to make 95 pounds, 95 cubic feet of gas per cow per day, but the variation is going to be like this. So let's think about that when we start projecting things out a little bit. It's, there's a lot of changes that happen on the farms, um, and so don't get hung up on the exact numbers. 
Um, I strongly recommend using Nutrient Catalog. Mark did a great job of providing reasons why. Um, I think it's an awesome resource. Um, I would say that even if I was not involved. It's a great resource. Um, multiple and/or treatment processes likely need to achieve farm treatment goals. So um, we'll get into that in a minute, a little bit more by way of this, the model or a working example. And again, that system solution that, that Jeff talked about is very, very important. And so uh, I believe in the term of integrated manure treatment, what is that? An assembly of manure handling treatment processes arranged in strategic fashion. So a lot of thought is put into this to accomplish identified farm water quality and our air quality goals and objectives. So what's different about the dairy industry than the poultry industry and the swine industry? <coughs> Besides one's a rumen and one's, the other ones aren't. More exactly, more independent. So most of the swine and most of poultry is integrated, right? So there's a corporation, they own the little pigs, they own the sows, farmer owns the barns, somebody owns the feed. The dairy industry, none of that, right? There's a lot of autonomy at the dairy farm level compared to the integrated species. So, uh, and farms all have their differences in opinion uh, on the dairy side. So this is very important, dairy part. And one of the things that I was asked when I interviewed for Cornell is, is like, well, how do you decide what a dairy farm needs? And luckily I knew the right answer to um, the gentleman who asked me, and that was you listen to what they're saying and think about what they really need to then present that to them. Not necessarily, they're not necessarily able to articulate exactly what they need. They're expecting you to be more knowledgeable than that than they may have. And so it's very, very critical. So let's go through a lurking example maybe of, uh, of, of an integrated manure treatment system, and then we'll um, so we have this uh, imported substrates, and we already all go all the way down to storage and digest and some other things. So I'm going to just go by this step by step. So this is a this is a integrated um, dairy manure treatment system, and it even you know ties into the crop side as far as spreading manure. Which sometimes us as you know us folks as engineers, we don't always think about the treatment side tied into the land application and crop process. But that's something we did need to be doing. So these imported substrates. All this is on sustainability, right? It, bring, it can bring dollars to the farm. Dollars for, if we have a digester for extra gas production, dollars for tipping fee, right? Um, out east, there's states are moving towards landfill bands of, of um, organic matter. So with, with uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, who else, Pete? Anybody else, yeah? All those little ones. All those little ones, right? Right, so lots of lots of thought about working with the dairy industry because now we got a society that says, well, we need somewhere for this organic matter to go. We can't put it in a, in a in a landfill anymore. So tipping fees, and then in some farms, some farm cases, nutrients are a good thing to bring in. You know, as we all know, they're good for crop production. We just don't want too many of them, and we don't we want to avoid the the four R's if we can help it. So dollars there. So then we have we have this reception pit. Um, where the uh, imported substrates are going, but there's off gases. We put that in a, in a biofilter, knock the odors down. If you've been to Denmark to see the uh, renewable energy um, um, enterprises um, in Denmark, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, lots of digesters, lots of this going on, and lots of biofilters on those buildings that are storing substrates for co digestion. So then they have the digester, right? So we take our effluent for a salmon or separator, which has the organic matter, 100% of it in there, ideally. In practice, not that much because some of it's in the sand. But anyway, co-digest that together so we get odor control, we get nutrient preparation. Remember the nutrients are more available to the crop if it's digested. Um, we do reduce greenhouse gas emissions significantly. Um, we get some revenue, and I say dot, 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 it depends on the state. Um, I think we all would get revenue, but where that revenue exceeds the cost of owning up the digest is a big question in New York right now, if it's not. Vermont it does, um, and, but there's RNG that's taken over and that's changing that a lot, which is way beyond the scope of this talk. Um, pre-treatment, so digesters are great for pre-treatment of advanced manure treatment. So I call advanced manure treatment anything downstream from digestion. Um, so we may go, we may add some chemicals, go into a belt filter press for one, one example working process where we're going to basically get a solid cake out, which is going to be concentrated nutrients. Um, we're going to get a liquid out, which is going to be dilution water for our salmon or separator. Salmon or separation always, always, always requires dilution water. The dilution water is needed to dissolve the mucus that binds the sand particle with the manure. Um, 
The better the dilution water quality, the less you need. The poor dilution water quality, the more you need. So a good thing there. Um, salmon water for separation can definitely reduce costs for the poor farm. Reclaiming that sand, putting it back in the stalls, um, we looked at that a long time ago. It's, it's a no-brainer um, for most cases where the numbers of cows are up to the CAFO, CAFO size. It does depend on the sand cost level. Um, and reduces soil compaction. Do we talk about soil compaction on the no treatment side? Not too often. We don't hear it a lot, but it's huge. Crop farmers, those, those of you who may work with crop farmers, know that they don't want sand lane manure spread on their roll on their ground. They don't want it. It's too heavy. They know about soil compaction. So we get a benefit there. All that contributes to sustainability. Um, of course, our covered storage, um, reduce odors, reduce greenhouse gases, reduce volume. Um, if you're in the RNG business, covered, um, uh, covered storage reduces your carbon index score for your farm by 35 points. It's a more negative five, it's a negative 35. Negative is good. Negative is good. So if you put all those things together, those, that's a system that's well thought out, lots of goals and objectives achieved and contributes towards sustainability in many ways, economic, social, and um, environmental. So I just wanted to, that's probably the last slide, so I wanted to just kind of go through some reasons why thinking about integrated system solution, backing up what uh, Jeff Porter said, and just kind of go through one integrated manure treatment. We have time for a couple of good questions. Yes, Rick. You just learned about individual components and characteristics and needs for individual components. What do you think the need is for systems such as this? Well, so I, so I, 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 I've been, so my, one of my, I think one of my key roles in this has been saying system solution, system solution, system solution. And so as the catalog shows, it's component by component by component. So, so the concept was we get that part done, and then in the future, at some point in time, when upper management says that's a good thing to spend money on, is that fair, Mark? Then we would put together system solutions where we would categorize like a known proven manure treatment screen, and would the, with that screen or integrated system on critical indicators, which may at that point be expanded because some of you know that um, AMR. This is not a huge topic now. That would someday is going to be a critical indicator, I think, sooner than later with our more group. Um, it's coming. Uh, I, don't, I think it's fair to say we're not working on it tomorrow morning. Right? There's other priorities. Good question. Others? Break time, so we'll. Yeah. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> So we will have about seven minutes of break time. I'm sure there's treats out there. Um, and then we have a follow-up session. This same room at 10 30 for more new equipment. And I really appreciate all the speakers. You can see they are still here. So let me go with them. We have 30 minutes. Thank you all.